Welcome to Friday Forum. I'm Oriana Maniera, a member of City Club's Forum Board. For more than 100 years, City Club of Portland is where civic-minded people have come together to find solutions to our region's biggest challenges. Today, we're a diverse network of people who are eager to learn, connect, and share ideas for a better Oregon. Thank you for joining us at the Sentinel Hotel in downtown Portland, where thousands of people are joining us online, on the radio, and on TV live. Live viewers are watching on KGW's website, Facebook feed, and news app. Our radio audience is listening via X-Ray FM stations, 107.1 FM and 91.1 FM. And TV viewers will watch today's program via Open Signal's community media television stations. We are incredibly grateful for the support of our media partners in bringing City Club forums to our community. In addition to City Club's valued media partners, our volunteers and staff enable us to put on Oregon's best civic programs week after week. Please join me in showing our appreciation to everyone who has made this event possible. <laughs> Portland is the last city in the United States with more than 100,000 residents to operate a commission form of government. How did this idea find its way to Portland? How has this style of government affected neighborhoods and communities across the city? And why have we held on to the commission system even after hundreds of US cities abandoned it decades ago, including Denver, Austin, Des Moines, and Sacramento? Here to help us untangle this history is Kristen Eberhard, senior researcher at Sightline Institute. Her research provided the foundation for City Club's recent report recommending a new system of government in Portland. Joining her are Misha Webley and Carl Abbott. Misha Webley is the communications manager at the Northeast Coalition of Neighborhoods. Misha was born and raised in Northeast Portland, is an independent filmmaker and screenwriter, and recently graduated from Portland State University after a long hiatus from school. Carl Abbott is a specialist on the history of American cities and city planning, on the history of the American West and Sun Belt, and on the later 20th century United States more generally. He recently retired after teaching for five decades in Portland State University's School of Urban Studies and Planning. He's written four books about Portland and many articles and papers about other cities. And we have a very special guest with us today who will be asking our first question during the public uh, question and answer session. I want to personally welcome Paul Mayer, a City Club member for the past 66 years. Uh, Paul's sitting at the president's table. Please show him some love. Paul served on the City Club Charter Committee that in 1963 wrote a charter amendment that went to voters in 1966. We look forward to hearing from Paul later in the program and we thank him for his longtime commitment to the City Club of Portland. And now, please join me in welcoming Kristen, Carl, and Misha to Friday Forum. Hi, everybody. Thank you for coming out today to talk about Portland city government. Um, for our, should I do the radio audience thing? Are you ready? For, the, for our radio audience, this is City Club of Portland's Friday Forum. I'm Kristen Eberhard, senior researcher at Sightline Institute, and I'm here today with Misha Webley from the Northeast Coalition of Neighborhoods and Carl Abbott from Portland State University. I'm going to set the stage with some history about Portland's um, form of government, and then the three of us are going to have a discussion, and then we'll have time for Q&A. So Portland has run a commission form of government for more than 105 years, but where did it come from, and how has it served Portland? The commission form of government was born in the aftermath of a crisis. In 1900, Galveston, Texas was hit by a massive hurricane that killed 12,000 people. And the city of Galveston, which was then the largest city in Texas, was turned to rubble. Um, after the storm, the survivors were faced with the task of rebuilding the city. And a group of wealthy businessmen known as the Deep Water Committee thought that to rebuild quickly and efficiently, it would be better to appoint a commission instead of electing officials. So they wanted the governor of Texas to appoint a commission of five experts in specific areas of public work so that they could get started. Um, so there was public challenge and a court challenge, and it turns out you do need to elect your officials. Um, but that idea of a commission of experts stuck. 
they just became elected experts. So this new form of government, this commission of elected uh, experts in specific areas of public works became popular across Texas and then it spread to other states. Chambers of Commerce liked this idea because they thought uh, subject matter experts could really get jobs done faster and more efficiently. And progressive era figures like Theodore Roosevelt and Woodrow Wilson liked it too because they saw it as an opportunity to develop competent city management in cities across the country. And for many voters, this form of government promised an end to, cor to corruption and the emergence of civil service that put the people first. So throughout the early 1900s, Portland, as well as other cities across the US, were struggling with problems of corruption and inefficiency. Once elected, politicians in Portland would reward their political funders um, with the spoils of their win, which was city jobs. So whoever had the city job, no matter how good of a job they were doing, um, was out and funders came in to do the job. As the saying went at the time, to the victor go the spoils, and who cares what happens to the city? So in 1913, the Portland Business Committee uh, community said, okay, we're gonna change this. We're gonna have competent people running the city. Um, and so they put this commission system of government on the ballot as an answer to the corruption. Um, it squeaked to victory with a margin of just 292 votes out of nearly 35,000 cast. And at that time, in 1913, about 500 cities were using a commission government. Um, but soon after Portland adopted, the commission form started to wane in popularity because cities were discovering that it turned out the system didn't solve the corruption and inefficiency in the way that they had hoped. In fact, um, Galveston, Texas, the birthplace of the system, ended up um, overthrowing the system due to public outrage about corruption in the commission form of government. Um, so Portlanders like to keep it weird, but in this case we weren't really weird so much as kind of just behind the curve. We adopted the system at the time it was kind of going out of style and then in, in those hundreds of other cities across the country overturned the system and we're, um, we're, we're talking about it. <laughs> so um, what is this commission form of government? How does it work? So in general, in the United States, we like to have a separation of powers. We have the legislative branch that writes the laws, and then the executive branch that implements the laws, and then the judicial branch that um, interprets the laws. The commission form of government kind of mushes them up. Um, so commissioners have both law making, law writing ability, and also law executing ability. So each commissioner in Portland um, has a vote on policies and ordinances for the city, and each of them acts as a chief executive officer of a bureau, running a bureau, um, making executive decisions, arguing for budgets for that bureau, and then they also have quasi-judicial abilities. They can make decisions on zoning appeals or other matters um, governed by legal procedures. So what this means is that a single commissioner in Portland could conceivably draft an ordinance, lobby for that ordinance to be passed through the council, vote for that ordinance, enforce that ordinance as the chief executive of their bureau, and then sit in a semi-judicial capacity deciding an appeal to that ordinance. It's a lot. It's a lot. So Portland's version of this commission form of government is a little different from the standard model. You'll recall that the standard model was you have um, specific areas of expertise that people run through. So for example, a ballot might include um, a position of public work, head of public works bureau, head of the public safety bureau, head of the Bureau of Development Services, and then if you're a candidate, you would say, I'm running for the public works bureau because I have this experience in public works, or here's my vision for public works. And then um, voters would get to decide, who do I think is best for public works, and then that person would run it. Um, Portland, keeping it weird. It's like, not so much with that whole subject matter expert thing. Um, we're just gonna run for seats one, two, three, and four, and then the mayor will later appoint commissioners to the bureau. So nobody knows. <laughs> 
Nobody knows who's going to be on what bureau. So a commissioner might run, for example, saying, I really want, I have this vision for housing, for example, or I have this vision for the police department, for example. But then they might not end up being the head of housing or the head of police. Um, so that connection of subject matter expert being in charge of a bureau um, got disconnected in Portland. So just a note, one other interesting thing about Portland system is we had five commissioners in 1913 when the city had 200,000 people in it. We have five commissioners today when the city has getting closer to a million people in it. Um, okay, so another piece of this system is at-large voting. So the commission system is sort of inextricably linked with at-large voting, which is a system that is unfortunately used a lot in the United States. So it means, you're, you've all seen it on your ballot, everyone in this whole city votes for each commissioner, but you vote for them in each position. So everybody votes for position one, everybody votes for position two, etc. And the result of that kind of a system is that if 50% plus one of voters want a certain kind of commissioner, they can elect 100% of the commissioners. Even if 49% of voters wanted something else, some other perspective being represented, they might get zero commissioners. So um, this commissioner form kind of sort of requires at-large voting because if you were to have districts plus bureaus, uh, that's a recipe for pork barreling, you would end up living in a city where, you know, Southeast Portland is known for its great garbage and recycling services and North Portland gets the best response times from police and Southwest Portland has the best parks, um, which would not be a city that works. So we have at-large voting. So this at-large voting is another reason that the commissioner system died out in hundreds of other cities because in 1965, United States passed the Voting Rights Act. And the Voting Rights Act made it illegal to create any voting law that results in discrimination against racial or ethnic minorities. And remember how I said you can get 50% you know, plus one, you get 100% of the voices on council. So if, like Portland, you have about a third of the population are people of color, it is entirely possible that they can end up with no representation um, as they did for many years in Portland. Um, so many communities used this Voting Rights Act to challenge at-large voting systems and they won. Court cases across the country found that at-large voting systems, um, quote, tend to minimize the voting strength of minority groups by permitting the political majority to elect all representatives. That's a quote from a court case. So when this happened, when there was an at-large voting system, a court found that it was discriminatory against racial minorities, um, the court had kind of two broad categories of remedy to offer. So the first one is districts. Um, everybody's familiar with districts. Um, but the weird thing about districts is that for a single winner district, that is you have a district and only one person wins in that district, um, for it to be a remedy to the Voting Rights Act, the jurisdiction has to have a minority majority district. That is, that the peop all the African American people or all the Latinx people or all the Asian American people have to live together so that the court can draw a line around them and make them a district. And then they can have a great shot at electing somebody. So the good thing about this remedy is the people in that district now have the chance to elect somebody who they want onto the council. But the bad things are that people of color, for example, outside of that district don't have such a chance at a representative because now maybe there is a representative of color, but it's not from their, their neighborhood. Um, and then also the other thing is that remedy depends on racial segregation continuing. So for that district to continue to work, you have to continue to have all of the Asian American people living in that place. And as people start to spread out, all of a sudden that remedy isn't so great anymore. So the second remedy 
um, is alternate voting systems. So in a lot of places, it turns out, are like Portland. We have about a third people of color in the city of Portland, but they don't all live in exactly one place. There's a spread out around the city, so you can't draw a minority-majority district. Um, so what courts did in this case was said you can use cumulative voting or um, ranked choice voting in a multi-winner election, and that gives, if you do the voting system right, then everybody gets a voice. If you have three winners and about a third of the people want one, a third of the people want another, a third of the people want another, then you get that diversity of views on the council. You don't just get the majority electing everyone. Um, so this was a remedy that was put in place in cities, counties, school boards around the country and um, consistently elected a more diverse group of people and also consistently boosted voter turnout in those communities probably because people saw their vote mattering more and saw somebody like them getting elected to council, and so they were more motivated to come out and vote. <clears throat> so, um, as an example, does the, the Cambridge, yeah. So just an example, this is the city of Cambridge, Massachusetts, which uses uh, multi-winner ranked choice voting to elect its city council and its school board. It has a somewhat similar racial makeup as Portland, but in the last, um, since 1995, you can see it's had much more diverse election results, a much more representative council and school board than what Portland has been able to elect. So Portland has a really striking lack of racial representation. Um, right now we have a very diverse city council, but in the history of the city of Portland, only three people of color and nine women have ever served on the city council. Joanne Hardesty is the first person of color to be elected to the council in a generation. And this is highly related to the way that we vote. And it's not just race, it's also geographic and socioeconomic representation. So most counselors come from neighborhoods where they are homeowners and most people in their neighborhood are homeowners. Um, they're higher income neighborhoods, they're more likely to be close in. So it's, it's uncommon to find a city councilor who lives outside of the innermost neighborhoods. We've never had a commissioner from St. John's or Park Rose or David Douglas, and only one, Randy Leonard, has ever lived east of 82nd. So for 105 years, we've seen the results of this at-large voting system and the commissioner form of government. So now it's time to ask, can we do better? And that is my <laughs> background and context. And now we're gonna have a discussion. So with that, I'm gonna um, kick it over to my fellow panelists um, to ask the opening question. So Portland has upheld this, um, oh, mm. I will remind our radio audience, this is City Club of Portland's Friday Forum. And we're here, I'm Kristen Eberhard, I have Misha Webley and Carl Abbott discussing Portland's commissioner form of government. Um, so, Portlanders have had the chance to, to change this and they've, they haven't changed it over time. So, but now there seems to be this increasing interest in change um, so Misha and Carl, what do you think is creating this shift that we're seeing in interest um, and where do you think that's going? I did a little calculation. I think that Portlanders have had, in the past, have had seven opportunities to change from the commission form of government and have rejected that, those opportunities every time. Um, and. I was thinking about, you know, why is, why would a city change its form of government? Because it's corrupt, um, because it's inept, or because it's inequitable. And Portland over the years has certainly, under commission government, has certainly had some corrupt systems, some corrupt administrations. Um, you know, the, uh, the 1940s was a corrupt period in Portland city history. Um, Portlanders actually responded by electing a reform mayor, but they didn't elect a reform council along with her. So she ended up, Dorothy Lee ended up, you know, not getting very far with the reforms that she was interested in. Um, but on the whole, 
uh, especially in the last 50 years, Portland has not been a corrupt city in the scale that causes communities to say, we've had enough, we're going to change. Um, and historically, Portland has not been particularly inept as a city government. Uh, in most cases, uh, Portland has seemed to work fairly well, and certainly through the 1980s and 90s and into the 21st century, when the city would do polling about, are you satisfied with the city government or services, would be generally favorable. So again, not a groundswell in the past that things were just not working anymore. Um, equity, um, Portland, as everybody knows, historically is a very white city. And you know, for many of the decades through which we've had the commission form of government, equity has simply not been, equity in terms of, of race and ethnicity has not been a particularly important issue on people's minds. It has, simply has not been prominent. Um, it's become much more prominent in you know, the last 10 or 15 years as the character of the city has changed uh, because of uh, migration of new communities, because of the annexation of the eastern part of the city with a much more diverse uh, population. So I, in this case, I think the changing character of the city itself brings equity to the fore as the, the key issue that would cause people to do some consideration. I would add to that that it seems that there is a feeling, kind of a growing feeling that that something's not right or something's not working in our city. Uh, we've, like a lot of cities in, in our country have experienced a tremendous amount of change in the last decade or 15 years. And in a lot of ways, I think Portland's got away with some of the systemic problems that it's had because we've been relatively small. You know, no one, I remember uh, going to New York, you know, early 2000s and told someone I was from Portland, they said, where's that? I said, Oregon, they said, huh? Oregon, uh, they, they had not heard of it. You know, two years later, it was a whole different story and everyone wanted to move here. Um, it's, all this stuff is kind of starting to spill out into the open, uh, inequities, economic inequalities, um, the cost of living is, is, is driving so many of these things, uh, you know, so much division and so much of a gap between, between people. And there's a sense uh, that, that no one's at the wheel. You know, or someone's asleep at the wheel, maybe, that no one's in charge. Um, and our elected leadership, what we're starting to see, uh, is really through no fault of their own in a lot of ways, um, in the city, they have their hands tied. Um, and they're not able to address uh, as effectively as we want some of the big issues that, that, that we're dealing with. And so there's this growing frustration because it just seems like no one's really able to take control and, and, and steer the ship. And so people are looking for solutions, and I think that's why um, well, everybody kind of wants to overthrow the government, but now it's starting to become a little more, a little more feasible, uh, or people are looking for those kind of solutions, um, and it's starting to gain a lot of traction, where, uh, whereas before, it just may not have felt uh, as urgent. And um, when we... Uh, Portland originally adopted this form, the thinking was to combat corruption. Carl, have there been times when the commission system successfully um, fought that corruption or, or, or did work well for the city? Well, I think that, you know, I was thinking that during the, you know, the first 50 years of commission government, um, it really was kind of old boys government as usual with just a different set of old boys in charge. Um, you know, uh, Mayor George Baker, for example, was a good old boy if there ever was one for, for four terms. Um, and it is, I think it's important to note, you know, Kristen mentioned the very, very narrow margin by which the you know, commission government was adopted. Um, and if you look at the voting pattern, there's a very strong, there was a very strong geographics you know, division, and the the neighborhoods that voted in favor of of this new form of government were the the new middle class neighborhoods on the east side of the city. They were um, the neighborhoods. They were um, Laurelhurst and Lads Edition and Irvington and those neighborhoods 
full of brand new houses and brand new homeowners who are worried about taxes. Um, you know, they worried about corruption because it meant high taxes, you know, inefficient government. So what they got was a period of limited government, a time when what did the city do? It did fire, protection, police, parks, streets, um, public buildings, social, no, but no, so, none of the social services that drive City Hall nuts today. Um, the, the intractable problems, they were the easy problems in, in a sense. Uh, starting about, you know, 50 years, you know, I'd say there's a, a first 50 years and a second 50 years, and the city got better leadership. Um, you know, I think starting with Mayor Terry Shrunk, um, it got people who are more effective at coalition building around what at the time was seen as progressive agenda. Um, there are things that we'd look back now and say, My, we wish they hadn't done that, but things that at the time were part of a progressive forward-looking agenda, like, if I say it, urban renewal, we now wish had been done very differently, but it was the mainstream of how you should do what a progressive city was doing. Uh, so 50 years of, I think, better, you know, less inept government, if you will, uh, more. And the other thing is some political leaders, mayors in particular, who could count to three, which is what you need to get something done. Um, you know, Vera Katz, you know, pretty obviously. I think Bud Clark, I think Neil Goldschmidt all had that ability. And Frank Ivancy also had the ability uh, to count to three, you know, on a, an agenda that in some ways interrupted the, um, that progressive flow, but, you know, a leadership that leaders who could figure out how to build a coalition um, and build the, build, find the votes and then announce the policy. Um, so it works well when you have, it has worked well, better put that in a past tense at the moment. You know, we don't know what the future is going to hold, right? So when you've had savvy political leadership. And in more recent history, who has benefited the most or been best represented and who has been burdened or least represented by this form of government? Well, I would say that the, the, those who have been least represented um, well, currently, as you touched on, all of East Portland. Um, that's, that's, that's most recent. I mean, we only, East Portland only became part of the city what, in, the, in the 70s. Um, we, as you said, have had two representatives now, I believe, from, uh, from that area. And that's a very diverse and very large area, very populous, too. Um, and, uh, you know, inner, inner Northeast Portland um, from, from the 90s on. Uh, really, with with the, with the urban renewal that that, that uh, Carl talked about, uh, was very negative and uh, negatively impacted. It's been a drastic, overwhelming change, uh, which many people from uh, in the Northeast, like myself, ended up out in, in East Portland as a result, and has basically flipped the demographic uh, of of who lives there. Um, and the thing is, is that it's it, it's not all about um, what kind of government we have, as, as far as pointing a finger. It's that. It, 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 it didn't help, um, and that there was no localized representation in, in these areas, and still is not say, in, in, in East Portland in a lot of ways, that can at least mitigate some of the oncoming change and can maybe manage it, can, can be responsive to the community, and can, can represent those needs uh, in City Hall or, or in, in, in other chambers, right? So it's a, you know, I think that's where it really falls short, where, where the kind of change we're seeing on the ground, there's not the, the people's voices aren't being heard. The people and and oftentimes those people and those voices are the are the are the the hardest to hear anyway. Um, and really, what they really need is is kind of a, a microphone or an amplifier. Um, and instead, it kind of it gets muffled out. And so, what the the system is controlled by then is um, is just a limited group of of, of voters. It's, it's, uh, and rather than um, th that are speaking to, or, or commissioners are speaking, because it's at large, are speaking to trying to, you know, 
everyone and are speaking more to pockets of the city rather than speaking to very localized concerns. I, I would add, I think that, that you know, the most members of, of the city council are very much aware of the, the disparities between kind of the core of Portland and you know, east part of the city uh, and try to, you know, you know, try to find resources to make, to make some difference, to make some balance, but there are demands for maintaining what you, the, the infrastructure and facilities you have, as well as investing in something new. How do you, you know, who wants to be the parks commissioner has to decide, you know, which park, which existing park is not maintained in order to, to develop a new park. Um, it's a real challenge, but it's obvious that, that the neighborhood that, that what benefits is my neighborhood. Um, when I'm talking to real estate people, I say I'm in Irvington. When I'm talking to activists, I say I'm in, I, I'm in Sabin. But, uh, <laughs> you know, it's, it's, it's the area that's done very well by itself. Uh, and I, I would point out that um, I live in the house that um, Charles Jordan, the first African-American city commissioner, lived in at one time. That's, that's my claim to fame. Do you put that on the real estate listing too? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, so what are the other options and what do we know about how they work? So we do this commissioner um, at large, five commissioners for what's now a pretty sizable city. What else could we do and, and what makes, what do we know about why, why it might be better for Portland? Well, I think a key in district elections is, is clearly how, you know, how many districts, you know, how you draw, basically how many districts, you know, how, you know, the bigger, you know, the more districts you have, the more potential for equitable representation or multiple group representation at the same time, you know, the harder it is to most likely to find, you know, maybe, possibly, politicians may be hard to herd together. Um, so you have the, the the trade-off of you know, number of districts versus efficiency in the um, in the actual operations of the city, um, and I don't know what. Um, I mean, the, the, I'm sure that there are. I haven't looked at the, them recently. Studies to indicate optimum size for city council districts. Um, I, mean, I lived in Chicago for a while, um, when it was the city that works because Mayor Richard Daley made sure that it worked. There were 50. 50 council districts with one independent alderman and 49 Democratic Party machine. Uh, so the politics behind the system are in many ways as important as the structure itself. And I would say I, I, I don't have a specific recommendation, uh, but I would say that in Portland we do have a pretty good starting point. I'm a little bit biased, but our neighborhood system um, that I'm part of the Northeast Coalition of Neighborhoods, we're one of seven geographical areas that represent uh, Portland. I'm in the inner Northeast, um, and th I'd say that's a pretty good starting point. Um, and I say that because th really, if you think about it, there's a lot of kind of natural dividing lines culturally and otherwise and economically in some ways. So North Portland is kind of, and it, it has its own thing. Uh, inner Northeast does too, so does Northwest. Um, in our system, I, we have one East Portland uh, office. I would say that needs to be at least two, uh, if not more. Uh, but I think that's a pretty good starting point because those, are, those have kind of fallen along some of those natural lines. And what we sort of do in, in, in our coalition and, 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 and in others, um, sort of try to fill the gap that the kind of lack of direct representation has, and that's sort of the, the role we serve. Um, but in in, 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 a, in a better world, in a better, better governmental system, that, that would be a, you know, a, a commissioner's office perhaps or someone that, that, that is, uh, that's right there in the neighborhood and has to be responsive to the community. And, and every community is different, every, you know, has different priorities, uh, but we are all in the same city. Uh, but the solutions to the, to the problems we have look a little different depending where you are. Uh, so I would, I, I would say start there, but uh, definitely, as you pointed out, we have the same amount of commissioners now as we did 100 years ago, and that really just doesn't make sense anymore. Yeah, and I'll just add that um, Portland is a real outlier in terms of its number of commissioners per people. We have more than 100,000 
residents per commissioner. Um, other big cities, there's, a, you know, we looked at other big cities and none of them were over 100,000. They were all more like 50,000. So that would put Portland at 10 or more commissioners for the size of city it is. So once you get up to 10 or more commissioners, um, now you have a lot more options in thinking about districts and how to arrange them. And I'll just add that um, single winner districts, the real advantage is that you can get down to this granular level of representation that that representative really knows their neighborhood. Uh, but there's sometimes a downside of, of that 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 each representative is sort of feel like they need to bring home the bacon for their district. And um, some, in some situations, they're not thinking about the city as a whole. Um, so the cities that I mentioned that made this change um, to multi-winner with some other kind of voting system. And one of the things that we see happening in those cities is that because you have multiple representatives representing the same district. So like in Portland, say we had we expanded the council to 12, and we had four districts, each of them with three representatives. You get this um, diversity of representation even within that same neighborhood, or even within that same area of the city, and then those three representatives might come from kind of different viewpoints about what should happen, but they're all representing the same constituents. Um, so we've seen this, state governments used to use this form of, gov of, of voting, and we um, did, there was a report that did some interviews with them, and they said that the just the the idea flow was really different when you could talk to somebody who was different than you, but representing your same constituents, and you started getting like different ideas coming out, and then you could form different coalitions because you had kind of your ideologically similarly minded people, but then you had your geographically similarly minded people, and they might lead to more creative thinking than right now sometimes we get um, stuck in certain lines. I just add, you can also, in terms of size, think about the Multnomah County you know, Commission. You know, obviously, more, you know, larger encompasses more than Portland, but essentially there's a, a Gresham district and some Portland districts. I, and the Portland districts are clearly too big, I think, for most people to have any sense of which county commission district am I in. Um, you know, Portland divided into four is, you know, is not enough divisions. And the idea of using the starting with the neighborhood association groupings as a starting point um, for, out of which you then tweak and equalize populations, et cetera, I think is actually a pretty promising idea. Okay, last question before we go to the audience. Um, is changing the form of government enough? What other things do we need to do? What other policies do we need to adopt or practices to make sure that Portland city government really is more equitable and uh, effective? Well, I'm going to put in a pitch for voter-owned elections, um, public funding of some sort for local elections. Uh, Portland tried it, um, should have kept it, um, almost kept it, should have. Um, Seattle right now is has a an alternative system of vouchers for helping, citizen vouchers for helping to fund local elections. Um, if Seattle can do it, Portland is certainly smarter than Seattle, so why can't we do it? And I would say, uh, you know, yes and no. Uh, no, it's not enough. It's, uh, uh, there's, there's a lot of work to do. Uh, yes, it's the first thing in a lot of ways that we have to do in order to get some of that work done. Uh, so it's, it is definitely the right starting point. But then uh, it's really that's that's when that's when the hard stuff begins. Um, a lot of ways structurally, we're uh, n not able to take on some of those those bigger problems now. Um, so um, so yes, both. And I'll make another pitch for democracy vouchers. <laughs> it's a sightline uh, issue. Um, democracy vouchers give every voter a hundred dollars in their pocket that they can give to candidates who opt in to not accept big money donations. So it changes the game in terms of if you're somebody who doesn't have a Rolodex, right now you often can't run, but in Seattle you can. And it's changed who was able to run in this last election when they used it. Um, but it comes with contribution limits. The city, uh, the state of Washington has contribution limits. Oregon does not. Um, so that is a, beyond Portland, a bigger problem. 
And then I'll just say one more. Um, a lot of our city elections end in the primary. Um, in the last, I think, 11 elections, eight of them have ended in the primary. And we know that primary voters are, well, it's a very small percentage of the population. It's often about 20% of people are deciding who is their city council representative. And those people are um, generally whiter, older, wealthier, and more partisan than your general election voters. So changing so that we actually get to the general election where more people can actually weigh in on their city councilor. Okay, now we are going to go to a question and answer with the audience. For the radio audience, this is City Club of Portland's Friday Forum. I'm Kristen Eberhard here with Carl Abbott and Misha Webley. We're gonna to go to the audience for some questions. Anyone watching or listening today is welcome to ask a question. If you've written it on an index card, hold it up high for the City Club staff to collect. And if you're not in the room, you can also submit questions via Twitter using the hashtag Friday Forum. Um, for City Club members who wanna ask a question at the mic, please identify yourself as a member and ask one question in 30 seconds or less. And our first comment and question is gonna come from Paul Meyer a member of City Club's 1961 research report on Portland's commission form of government. He was also the chair of a committee that drafted a charter amendment in 1963, and Portlanders voted on that in 1966 and rejected it 62 to 38. And here we are. He is going to share some thoughts with us. I want to thank you. Is this on? I want to thank you very much for this opportunity to speak to the group. Uh, my involvement in City Club has been a long time. In 1958, I was lucky enough to serve on a blue ribbon committee chaired by a uh, previous president of the club, which uh, studied the whole form of city government and came out with a report for a strong mayor form. I then had the privilege of chairing a subcommittee that actually drafted a charter to be put on the ballot uh, that carried out the provisions of that report. That was the first action <laughs> City Club ever took. Of course, subsequently, City Club has become more actively involved in following through on its reports and taking action. but. Um, and I was also co-authored a major report on the Portland Development Commission. And so I've been very involved and very in, uh, concerned about City Club. I was vice chair of the uh, research committee for some years. But <clears throat> we, what happened is in 1961, after the, uh, we did the uh, version of the report, I then organized a group to put the, uh, that provision on the ballot. And I, we had a coalition of the Young Democrats, Young Republicans, Junior Chamber of Commerce, and League of Women Voters. And we got it on the ballot. Unfortunately, it lost. In uh, 2006, Robert Ball uh, put on the ballot by himself, uh, remarkably, a ballot measure for a strong mayor uh, council form of government in Oregon. And um, that was not a, uh, and, and I was on the committee that evaluated that, and we voted nine to three to support it. Unfortunately, the, someone in the City Club administration, uh, this happens, <laughs> released the information prematurely to the opposition because uh, the person opposed uh, the, rep the report. And so, when the City Club met at the Multnomah Athletic Club for the meeting, about 20 people were lined up at the microphone, all coming down from City Hall to oppose it, and the City Club voted against it. So, um, not a very happy time. So I would say then that um, uh, I, the only criticism I have of this report, which I think is long overdue, but I mean, I love it that you're coming up against the commission form 
for all the good reasons that you have elucidated. However, uh, Portland is way too large for a city manager. And I would urge the city club research committee and the board to consider a follow through committee to reconsider whether Portland should not have a strong mayor. Now, you may not know it, but Portland is the, um, let me get this here. <laughs> we are the 26th most populated city in the United States. And if you get us down to the, um, what's called the combined statistical area, we are 18th largest. Now, city manager is great for small towns, but not for the city of Portland. And I urge you to appoint another committee to reconsider the issue of a strong mayor rather than a city manager, because I think that is an inappropriate solution entirely for the city of Portland. Thank you very much. Hello. Uh, I just have a brief comment and then a question. Comment, I just want to, um, I really appreciate that the City Club is taking on this issue. Uh, our methods of voting matter. I think we all learned that lesson in the last presidential election, and I'm trying to imagine what it would look like if we had an at-large system for the United States of America. Kind of scares me to think about it. Um, also, I actually hail from the second largest uh, city originally, uh, with a commission form of government, Fargo, North Dakota, population 125,000, and uh, except it's worse because there is no runoff election, which means that, and there is no primary, which means that you can get commissioners like Commissioner Pepcorn, who won by 17% and is currently advocating to have all refugees in the city tested for tuberculosis. Oh my God. Just to, again, show another example. Um, as for the question, I'm trying to figure out what is different this time than the last previous seven times that it came through. Uh, you talked about how the city is obviously going through a pivotal time right now with kind of a tsunami of people moving here and, and cost of living issues, but was the method of voting addressed the previous seven times? Because I think that that is the thing that will resonate the most with voters. The, you know, no, previous times, I think it was always assumed it would be, you know, you know, single, you know, single, you know, not a, you know, multi-member -dis district or, you know, ranked voting um, was always kind of the standard yay or nay among, you know, choose your favorite candidate among, for, off the list. You're saying it was all at, at, at large. And, at, it, or some of the suggestions had districts, but they too were, um, you know, choices of, you know, only one candidate, no, no, none of the ranked voting or proportional representation. Hi, uh, I'm a city club member, name's Tamara DeRitter. Um, my, my point is I've experienced some strange siloism recently. I, I uh, brought to the attention of Mayor Ted Wheeler's staff that the well-filled protection overlay that we have uh, along the Columbia River does not include protections of the railway or any of the roadways, because I've done two of those well-filled protection ordinances. And I was told by one of their staff that I need to also bring this up with uh, Chloe Udaly, because she's in charge of PBOT, and then also Joanne Hardesty, because she is in charge of emergency services. Now, why is that on me and not her as a staff member? Um, it, so I, I think there's a, a problem there as far as communication and the fact that I have to do that. Um, and also, how would a strong city manager or um, a mayor form of government um, make a difference? Thank you.
I'd say that the the, the siloism that you're, that you're talking about is very real. I think a lot of people have experienced that. Um, and, and that's one of the, the, the issues. So you have, you know, bureaus that are, you know, they'll fight each other to take the credit when things go well, and they'll, they'll dish it off when, when things aren't going so well or they have a, a very difficult question or something that's, uh, that's out of their hands. Um, and, and I think that's part of, uh, as I was saying before, about a, a sense that there's, you know, who do you go to? Who's actually in charge here? Um, and then very real issues get, get left behind uh, because everyone is trying to, to keep distance from it because they don't have a good answer for you. The only other thing I would say is, you know, some of that can be changed within a current system if the commissioners themselves make it clear to the staff that the job of the staff is to talk to each other. And if you develop a culture of shared, you know, you know, you know, you know kind of both shared accountability and shared credit for developments rather than only one department or one other department. So some of that's, you know, you know a bureaucratic culture question, uh, which of course bureaucratic cultures change at about the pace of an ocean liner trying to get into the lock in the Panama Canal. <laughs> and, and real quick, uh, it's hard to get your voice heard as one person. If you're five people, they start listening. Uh, and so I would, if for, for any issue like that, uh, the n numbers really do matter and they start returning your phone calls a lot faster. I'm Sam Metz, a City Club member. We've heard about two conflicting, almost mutually exclusive functions of city leadership. One is to represent the diverse voices in the community, including uh, religious diversity, economic diversity, geographic, age, gender, uh, ethnic, uh, clearly something that requires more than five people. And on the other hand, we expect our government, uh, our city leadership to provide competent administration of highly complex departments that can't be run by amateurs. What form of government would you recommend that could take care of both of these expectations? Well, I would suggest, you know, if you want the representation, you need a, you know, a council, a legislative body of some sort with diverse membership. So it has to be large enough to have diverse membership. And you need a strong executive to do the management. So that moves us toward a strong mayor system, uh, maybe. Uh, but you need, you need to think about you know, a legislative representative function and a, um, an executive administrative function as the two parts of what you need. And how you structure to get that is there are many possibilities. Yeah, this is actually the problem at the heart of the commission form of government. Your legislative branch is there to speak for the people. Right, it's there to speak for the full diversity of people, and that's why we have, you know, 500 members of Congress. It's why we have 60 members of the state Senate. Um, so we need more than five in Portland to speak for the people. But there's a separate function of administering agencies in every other type of government. At the state, you have your legislators and you have your administrative branch. At the federal level, you have your legislators who are sort of speaking for the people, deciding policy direction. And then you have your administrators who are the professionals who are implementing um, those policies. In Portland, they're mixed up together, and it's hard to get both. It's hard to get both, you know, speaking for the people and also being an expert at uh, parks. Nielsen, City Club member. I applaud the, the research committee of the, of the City Club for their hard work in coming up with the recommendations that were approved by the City Club, and I can certainly concur with that. My question is one of process. Is there an example of how you would go Assuming we could have an election and it were approved, how do you physically make the shift from one form to the next? Is it Friday afternoon, these commissioners and people leave, and Monday morning the new, because it seems like the transition itself totally changes the roles, probably adds more people and less full-timeness, perhaps. I mean, it, there's lots of implications, and I wonder, is there a model of a city that in sort of current times has made that transition and how did they do that? I'm sorry, this is the last question. Yeah. Um, I, 
So Seattle recently made a shift from at-large to districts. And the way that they did it is they, they passed a ballot initiative that said starting this year, we're going to move to districts. And that year, they redid, you know, they had every position up for election. But some of them were designated as two-year terms and the others as four-year terms. So then some of them were then, again, up for election in two years so that you could get the alternating. So you just do it all at once. And then if you want to have alternating years, you just say some of these positions are two years. Okay, one more. <laughs> I'm Joe Hertzberg. I'm a City Club member, just recently, actually. Um, and I was on the Charter Commission in 2006 and 7 that spent about a year and a half drafting a very detailed ballot measure that went down three to one. Um, you and the report have made a very strong case for why we need to change from the system that we've got but we need to change to something with hundreds, literally hundreds of details, and every one of those is an opportunity to lose voters. So this is another process question. How do we go from where we are to creating a ballot measure that can actually get a majority? That's a question. Well, that's a really good question. <laughs> <laughs> um, <laughs> and you know the, the 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 Charter Review Commission. I think you guys you guys did did great work. And then the the problem is you hand it off to elected officials and ask them basically to vote against their own interests and send vote themselves out of office in a lot of ways. And I think that's 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 you know that's pretty flawed. Um, and the only other way around that is 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 a straight ballot measure and straight to the people, uh, which which is its own uphill battle. Um, but, but the good news is that work such as uh, you've done and, and, and that the City Club now has is that the, the, the ammunition and the details are in a lot of ways are already there, uh, at least as a pretty good starting point. Um, and it's really a matter of taking up the, the, the mantle and, and, and running with it. Um, and yeah, there'll be tons of details to figure out, um, but, but, I, but we're not starting from scratch. And with that vague but optimistic insight, <laughs> Our time is up and we'll have to pause the conversation for now. We are grateful for everyone who made today's forum possible. Thank you to Oriana Maniera for producing this forum, to Paul for sharing the history and insights, and for Kristen, Carl, and Misha. Thank you so much. We are adjourned. <laughs>